بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتابة بيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم Respected Imam Zahir brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته If my voice is almost gone it's because I've been lecturing all over Britain for the last one month and I mean all over Britain. And on Sunday, I had to conduct an all-day seminar until 9 o'clock in the night in Birmingham on Dajjal. I am 76 years of age, and in my life, I've never, never, never come across anyone teaching the subject of Dajjal for a whole day, never in my life. So this made me the first time. I still have not recovered. So bear with me if my voice is a little because that the remedy for this is uh, you squeeze a lemon or two lemons and you add honey uh, don't add any water at all just the lemon and the honey and you sip take a little teaspoon and sip while you're talking we're too late for that now our subject tonight is an exceptionally important one and even though we are few in numbers there is barakah from Allah if you teach the Quran, if you teach the Quran correctly. And uh, our topic is Constantinople in the Quran. And in my life, I've never heard anyone speaking on this subject, never. So you may be hearing on this subject for the first time as well. And in the process of introducing Constantinople in the Quran, I will be forced, I cannot avoid it. I have to turn to Dajjal. So there will be a brief part, portion of this talk on the job. I, I ask of you, I plead with you to pay careful attention. And whenever there is a reference to the Quran, when you go back home, go and find that verse in the Quran and study it. And when there is a reference to a hadith, go and find the hadith and study it. This way your knowledge will increase, inshallah. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers. And in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam. And we thank Him for this opportunity to address you here at Tooting Masjid, my first time in this masjid and we thank the Imam Zahir for his kind invitation. Constantinople is one of two cities which are of supreme importance in Islamic eschatology or the study of the end time in Mu'akhir al-Zaman. Our Prophet has spoken more than anyone else about this subject of the end time and if we have this knowledge and we do not use it we have to answer to Allah right? yes this is not a subject to be trifled with to be neglected this is a supremely important subject but we do not have the time to explain its importance there are two cities in Islamic eschatology which are the supremely important cities of the end time, and they're most certainly not New York and London. No, they are Jerusalem and Constantinople. And as we proceed with this lecture, you will get the evidence tearing you in your face that both Jerusalem and Constantinople are the two supremely important cities in Akhirul Zaman, in Islamic eschatology. We must begin because we don't have the whole night. We have to begin with a hadith of Sahih Bukhari in which Allah's Messenger speaks and it's a strange hadith. And I have spent a long, 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 long time with this hadith and could not understand it. And if I do not understand a hadith, I am not going to quote it. No. 
Only when I'm comfortable that I've understood the hadith, only then will I quote the hadith. And it took me a long, 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 long time with this hadith. Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, refers to a city. And he says about this city, Janibun minha fil bah, wa janibun minha fil bar. It's a city, one part of which adjoins the land, and one part of which is by the sea. And then something more about the geographical location of the city is a city which is shaped like a triangle. A triangle has three sides, even in Tutin it has three sides. Eh? And if people come to this city, and by Allah's leave, they are blessed to conquer the city without fighting. Who are these people? And how do they conquer the city? They say, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, and one side of the city falls. And then they repeat it, and a second side falls. And then they repeat it, and a third side falls. This is strange. And these people are referred to as Banu Ishaq. And so they are not Banu Ismail. They are not Arabs. They are this side. From Banu Ishaq came Banu Israel. Okay? So from Banu Ishaq, they have to be a people from Banu Israel. But why does the Hadith does not refer to them as Banu Israel? Why are they referred to as Banu Ishaq? Maybe because we have to do a little bit of sifting to be careful with these people. Which city is this? When the third side of the city falls, and now it is now their city, a city of the Israelite people, the people who follow the Torah, the people who are not allowed to work on the Sabbath day, the Sabbath day. So if you're not allowed to work, you're not allowed to fish. Those of you who are familiar with the Quran will already know what's going on now. <laughs> if you are familiar with the Quran, they're not allowed to fish. But if you've been neglecting your Quran, you say, what is he talking about fishing? Because you've neglected your Quran. <laughs> That's why you don't know what I'm talking about. There are some of you who are shaking your heads because you recite the Quran. So you know about fishing. Which city is this? And when the third side fell, then these people are told the Jal has been released amongst your people. So now we know it's a city. It's a city which an Israelite people will conquer peacefully. It's a city where you're not allowed to fish on the Sabbath day. And it's a, it's a city in which Having been conquered peacefully, the Jal is now let loose amongst them. And when the Jal is let loose amongst them, you will find strange things happening from that city. Good. Our conclusion is that the city is Constantinople. Because Constantinople is precisely such a city, part by the sea, part by the land. And Constantinople is shaped as a triangle. But we do not insist on that. No. If someone does not wish to accept our identification of the city as Constantinople, that's your view. This is mine. You cannot prevent me from offering this identification of the city as Constantinople. But before we proceed now to the Quran, I need to take a little time with Dajjal. Because Dajjal is released amongst them. And I just completed a whole day seminar on the Jali in Birmingham. Briefly now, and we cannot do it other than briefly, he is known as Al-Masih al-Dajjal because he wants to declare an Al-Masih, I am the Messiah, but he's a liar. Because the Messiah, Al-Masih, is Nabi Isa al-Islam. Nabi Isa al-Islam came and left and will return. And Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that when he returns, he is returning to rule. 
He's returning as Hakim to rule. So he will rule the world when he returns. I lectured in a Shia masjid, no Shia Islamic center in Manchester a few days ago on the Messiah and the Imam. And I had to tell them. But when Nabi Isa alayhi salam returns, he's returning to rule. Rule the world. And this is from Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. So Imam al-Mahdi is not going to be ruling the world. No. But they have this belief that Imam al-Mahdi is superior to Nabi Isa alayhi salam. And he will rule the world. So we had to correct that. Of how humble. Alhamdulillah, they took no offense. They didn't throw me out of the place. Alhamdulillah. He wants to impersonate the true Messiah. If he is to successfully impersonate the true Messiah, then he will have to rule the world. And it is the Jews who will have to accept him as the Messiah. And the Jews will not be accepting him as the Messiah if he's ruling the world from Washington, would it? No. He has to rule the world from Jerusalem for the Jews to accept him as the Messiah. And he has to therefore rule the world from a holy state of Israel located in Jerusalem. And this holy state of Israel must be the ruling state in the world. Only then will the Jews accept Dajjal as the Messiah. Is there anyone who differs with me? Good, we can proceed. So Dajjal wants to rule the world from Jerusalem, from what he will call a holy state of Israel, but which we recognize as a bogus state of Israel. But it'll have to be a ruling state in the world. Let us now leave Dajjal and go to the Quran. There are many cool boys who say, Oh, there's no Dajjal in the Quran. So that's not, that's not the subject we should be studying. Tell this cool boy to sit down a little bit and learn. Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam has succeeded his father, Nabi Dawood alayhi salam. And Allah spoke to Nabi Dawood alayhi salam. After having spoken to the angels and said to the angels on the first page of history, I'm going to place on earth those who will be Khalifa. Khalifa. What is Khalifa? Who is Khalifa? Let the Quran answer that. I don't need answer from some Dikan Hari. I want the answer from the Quran. And Allah speaks to Nabi Dawood alayhi salam and listen to what he says. بَعَدَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ يَا دَعُود إِنَّا جَعَلْنَاكَ خَلِيفَةً فِي الْأَرْضِ Oh, beautiful language. Clear and crisp. <laughs> oh, David, Nabi Dawood alayhi salam. I'm here, I'm appointing you as Khalifa on earth. Now we know. If Nabi Dawood alayhi salam is appointed as Khalifa on earth, what is the function of a Khalifa? Allah goes on to say, فَحْكُمْ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ بِالْحَقِّ You must now, as Khalifa, you must rule, you must establish government, you must establish law on the basis of the truth, and the truth does not come from CNN, it comes from Allah. That is the function of a Khalifa. And when he establishes that government, then that state is known as a Khilafah state. They chose to give it another name. They call it the Holy State. We call it the Khilafah state. It's the same thing. So Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam has inherited the greatest state in the world, the Khilafah state. And Allah has strengthened and made the state powerful. He says so in the Quran. And he is ruling the world. From where? From Jerusalem. That's right. And then he has an experience that shattered him, caused him tremendous pain. Allah says, Walaqad Fatanna Sulaiman. 
we cause him distress, fitna. What did Allah do? When we study it, it has to be a vision that Allah has given to him. Like Allah gave to Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam, a vision, Ya Bunayya, inni ara anni azbahu. I've seen in the anna inni ara fil manami anni azbahu. I've seen in my sleep that I must sacrifice you. It was a vision. Similarly here, it was a vision. وَلَقَدْ فَتَدْنَا سُلَيْمَانَ وَأَلْقَيْنَا عَلَى كُرْسِيهِ جَسَدْ And we placed a jasad on his throne. What is a jasad? We come back to that in a moment, insha'Allah. When he saw this jasad sitting on his throne, he was so terrified by what he saw. He immediately recognized this jasad to be an evil, evil, evil being. And this jasad wants to inherit my throne and my kingdom, to rule in my place. Who could that jasad be? He immediately turned to Allah, summa anab, penitently. And if you want to ask something from Allah, then the first thing you do is to first seek forgiveness and then you ask for what you want. So he said, Rabbi, Allahumma firli. Walaqad fatanna Sulaiman wa alqayna ala kursihi. Just a call a Rabbi firli. He said, Oh my Lord, my God, Ya Rab, kindly forgive, have mercy on me, forgive me. Wahabli mulkan la yambagi li ahadin min ba'di and grant that my kingdom cannot be inherited by any after me and grant that my kingdom cannot be inherited by any after me meaning i don't want him to inherit my kingdom so said so done and allah accepted his dua and as soon as nabi sulaiman alayhi salam died the khilafa state or the holy state of israel collapsed finished and the Israelite people were broken hearted because they didn't know why. Up to this day, they don't know why Holy Israel collapsed. We know. They don't know. We know it because Allah has given us the explanation in the Quran. And what are we doing with the knowledge in the Quran? Let me tell you what we're doing. We eat our biryani and we go home and sleep. That's what we're doing. Yes. And when someone comes who has the knowledge and is teaching, they close the doors of the masjid on him. This is the miserable world in which we live today. So when the holy state of Israel collapsed, they were broken hearted. And in that state of pain and distress, then Allah gave them the good news. That I'm going to send to you one who will be known as the Messiah, Al-Masih. And when he comes, he will bring back that golden age of Suleiman He will bring back the holy state. And you will rule the world once again because when he comes, he will rule the world. That's the Messiah. They don't know. They don't know why Allah gave this promise to them. That the Messiah will come to them. We know why Allah gave the promise of a Messiah to them. What are we doing with that knowledge? Huh? This is in the Quran. And so, when the Messiah came, of course, some of them accepted him, and the others rejected him. And when they saw him die on the cross before their very eyes, some of them celebrated. Yeah, it's there in the Quran. They can't accuse me of anti-Semitism because it's in the Quran. But the others wept. They wept. Then the Roman government expelled them all from Jerusalem. And after the expulsion, those who celebrated are now no longer called the Israelites. They're now given a new name. They're called Al-Yahud, the Jews. And those who wept are no longer called the Israelites. They're now given a new name. They're called Al-Nasara, the Christians. And these two combined are now called Ahlul Kitab. So now the term Banu Israel is not used anymore. It is replaced with Ahlul Kitab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then explained in the Quran 
Having been expelled, Allah placed a ban on them that they could never return. They could never return to reclaim Jerusalem as their own. Hatta idha putti hati ajudu wa ma'jud wa hum min kulli hadabin yamsidu Until Gog and Magog are released and when they are released, they spread out all over the world with their indestructible power. They take control of the world. And they will bring the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. So this is a one-time event in history. Are you, not, are you noticing? When Gog and Magog are released and they spread out in all directions, and with their indestructible power, they take control of the world. This will be a one-time event in history. So you really got to be blind if you miss it. <laughs> But after they spread out in all directions, they will then be able to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. But until then, the Jews are prohibited from returning. The Christians are also prohibited from returning. But Allah says about the Jews, وَقَطَعَنَاهُمْ فِي الْأَبْدِ أُمَمْ Allah broke them up into bits and pieces and scattered them all over the world. So Jews in Argentina, and Jews in China, and Jews in Moscow, and Jews all over the place. But what about the Christians? These are the people who believed in the Messiah. They have faith in their heart. Why should Allah punish them like this? Cut them up into bits and pieces and scatter them all over the world. They deserve to be treated differently. So now let's go to the Quran and to Constantinople in the Quran. And it is Surah to Surah to Al-Araf. And we'll begin around verse 163. So would you kindly take a note? So you go home and check it out. And Allah speaks about the town. وَسَأَلْهُمْ عَنِ الْقَرِيَةِ الَّتِي كَانَتْ حَاضِرَةَ الْبَحْرِ And ask them about the town which was located by the sea. By the sea. And in this town, are a people who are obliged to obey the law of the Torah because the law of the Torah prohibits you from working on the Sabbath day. The law of the Torah was not sent to anybody else. No, only to these people, Banu Israel. So it is a part of Banu Israel who are in this town. Yes, it could be the Jews because they've been scattered all over the world. It has to be the, the Christians who are called Banu Ishaq and who have been blessed by Allah to conquer this town, this city, without a fight. So Constantinople has to be a Christian city. And in this Christian city are people who are obliged to obey the Sabbath. And in the Sabbath, you're not allowed to fish. So Allah tested them. And Allah says that He sent the fish to them on their Sabbath day. Sabtihim, their Sabbath day. Now, you might want to do some research and decide. When Allah says their Sabbath day, my, my student Ash, Ashraf over here is arguing, what they did was to change the Sabbath. Yes, the Christians. The Sabbath day was Saturday, the day after Jummah. But they changed the Sabbath day and they made it Sunday, the first day of the week. And they did it through a gradual process. So when Allah says He sent the fish to them on their Sabbath day, I still hold the view that Allah is referring to the Sabbath day, which is Saturday, the day after the one. But it is possible that He is right, He is sitting right there, that Allah may be saying that your Sabbath day is now your Sabbath day, Sunday, all right? So let's proceed. So the fish will come to them on the day of the Sabbath. Big like this, and they're jumping up, you could see them. Now this is terrible. On every other day of the week, the Quran continues to say, the fish never came. What a terrible trial. Will they fish or will they be faithful to the law? The Quran says, some of them went fishing <laughs> and others remain faithful to the law. And amongst them, there were those who were warning that these are people, Allah will punish them. 
And these who say we are warning them, we are only doing that so there will be evidence that we warn them. So please check out this portion from 163, okay? When they went fishing, it is, it is implicit in this that they were abandoning the law. Abandoning the law. One part of the Christian world still holding on to the law. Maybe not the whole thing, but part of it. Another part of the Christian world abandoning the law. Allah then punished them. Guess what he did? Do you know what he did? He turned them into monkeys. You know, your answer should be, your answer should be. He then declared, Kunu kiradatan khasi'i. That is the answer I want from you. Kunu kiradatan khasi'i. Be apes despised. Apes, monkeys. Oh, but wait a minute. Never in the Quran has Allah spoken like this. No. He says about the people who have eyes and yet cannot see. Oh, we have a lot of them today. We have a lot of them today. They have eyes and yet cannot see. And Allah says about them, Ula'ika kal an'am. They are just like cattle. They are like cattle. He never said that they are cattle. No. He said they like that. He said about those people who have the Torah and do not live in accordance with the Torah, in accordance with the Torah, Masaluhum kamasalil himar. They're just like donkeys. But he never said that they are donkeys. No, he said they are like donkeys. And then he said, Masaluhum kamasalil kalb. They are like dogs. But he never said that they are dogs. But here, be apes, kudu, kiradatan khasi, be apes, despise. Can a human being be transformed into an ape in, on the basis of the guidance of the Quran? Not your imagination. I'm not talking about your logical reasoning. I'm talking about the guidance of the Quran. No. When Allah creates a human being, He breathes into him. And that human being remains with that ruh until judgment day. Remaining as a human being until judgment day. A human being cannot, accordance, in accordance with the guidance of the Quran, be transformed into an ape. Schoolboys can say what they want. Well then, is it that the way of life of the apes is something despicable? Kunu kiladasan khasin be apes despise. No, the way of the life of apes is not despicable. An ape or a monkey is naked, doesn't put on clothes. But nothing shameful about that, that's his way of life. Huh? And he conducts his sexual life in public. Is it shameful? No, that's his way of life. The apes go stealing from each other, they're fighting with each other and so on. That's their way of life. Well then what does it mean? Be apes despise. We have eliminated number one. We have eliminated number two. Only number three is left. And that is these people who are created by Allah as human beings. And Allah says about every human being, Wallaqad karramna bani Adam. I have honored human beings. That these human beings who have been blessed by Allah and honored as human beings. They abandon the way of life of a human being and they begin to live like the apes. When you see that, you can recognize these are the people who have been cursed by Allah to live like apes, a despicable way of life. That is despicable. Well then how can we find them? When you see people unable to distinguish between private space and public space, in private space, you can be without clothing. Yes. You're in your bedroom with your wife. You're, this is private space. But they come out in public naked. Yeah. When they start taking off their clothes in public, and they come out in naked with a preference for public nudity, nudity this, these are the apes. The only people who are doing that today is from this civilization, modern Western civilization. And from here, it is catching on to other places. It starts here. These are the apes punished by Allah 
to live a life which is less precarious. And uh, when you see a people engaging in sexual relations in public rather than in private, nobody in the whole of history did that. No people, no civilization. This is the only one showing this mysterious preference for public sexual relations. They are apes. And it is because Allah is so angry, so angry, so angry with these people that for the first time in the Quran, he says, be apes and be swine, khanazi, khinzir. So now we have to go to Constantinople to see when did Dajjal enter and what did he do? I made the mistake when I wrote my book, Jerusalem and the Quran, some 18 years ago, I said that Tamim Udari came to the Prophet Islam, and that's the hadith about Dajjal being on an island, you know about it, and it changed. His hand chained to his neck, his feet chained, you know about that. You must shake your head when I ask you a question. <laughs> so I know you know what I'm talking about. And. Uh, then the Prophet ﷺ suspected a Jewish boy to be Dajjal. What was his name? Ibn Sayyad. Two things, you got some homework to do. Huh? Ibn Sayyad. And the Prophet went to question the boy. And the boy was impertinent in his answers. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was angry. He said, O Messenger of Allah, give me permission. I cut off his head. And then the Prophet said, no, no, Umar, if he is Dajjal, you cannot kill him. No one can kill him. Only Nabi Isa Islam can kill him. And if he is not Dajjal, it will be sinful. And I said that this was a message from the Prophet Islam, informing us that Dajjal is released. Of course, Ibn Sayyad was not Dajjal because he died. He never ruled the world. He never brought back the golden age. So I came to the conclusion that this was a message from the Prophet indirectly informing us that Dajjal was released. And I was correct in that. But then I went on to say something which I should not have said. I said he was released from his chains at this time. There I made my mistake. Why? Because the Christians conquered Constantinople and it became a Christian city with a peaceful conquest about two to three centuries before the Quran was revealed. <laughs> and this hadith said that Jal has been released amongst your people. So this is clear evidence that the Jal is already in Constantinople two to three hundred years before the Tamimodari evidence. Is it possible that he was released at this time? No, I'm not going to make the mistake again. <laughs> no. I'm going to say he was released, he has evidence, he's released at this time in Constantinople. But maybe he was released before that. I don't know. Indeed, it is possible. And if you are research students, alhamdulillah, I'm 76, my time is coming to an end. So you are young people, do the research. But don't think, don't make the mistake. Do not make the mistake to believe that you can study the Qur'an unless you first ensure that you are reciting the Qur'an in Arabic from cover to cover at least once a month. If you are not doing that, you will never be able to study the Qur'an. Never! Remember the warning from me, okay? If you are reciting the Qur'an in Arabic from cover to cover at least once a month, and that is a good beginning to one day be able to study. Reading the Quran and getting the information of the Quran is one thing. Any schoolboy could do that. Anybody could do that because it's plain book. But to study the Quran is a totally different thing. Allah has given a methodology. Allah has given it. I have written a book entitled Methodology for Study of the Quran to help you. The book should be downstairs, I believe. If you do the proper methodology for study of the Quran, maybe one of you might be able to come to the conclusion that at that time that Nabi Sulaiman Islam saw the vision, that was when he was released from his chains. Okay?
Well, I am not saying that. No, no, I don't want to make another mistake. Now then, back to Constantinople. We now have to look for evidence of Dajjal amongst the Christians in Constantinople. And we go to Surah to Rome. The Christians have already changed the Sabbath day from Saturday to Sunday. The Christians are already worshipping Jesus as the Son of God. The Christians already have the Trinity. And Allah says in the Quran, do not say Trinity. Allah says in the Quran, do not say that Jesus is the Son of God. Allah says all of these things in the Quran. But by the time the Quran was revealed, they had already corrupted everything, these things. And Constantinople was already a Christian city with all of these corrupted beliefs. But they were attempting in Constantinople to establish a holy state. That's why it's known as the Holy Byzantine Empire. And the Roman Empire defeat uh, sorry, the Persian Empire defeated the Byzantine Empire. And this happened while we were in Medina. No, sorry, we were in Makkah. We were in Makkah. And the Prophet Islam and the Muslims are being taunted by the Quraysh. Because the Quraysh is identifying with the Persian Empire. And we Muslims are identifying with the Christians. And then Allah sent down something strange. Allah says in Surah to Rome, Guli Bati Rome. Rome has been defeated. Rome here yeah, meaning Byzantium, the Holy Byzantine Empire. I had dinner with a group of Orthodox Greek Christians in a, a city called Huddersfield, close to Leeds. Huddersfield? Huddersfield, close to Leeds. And they're all highly educated people. And when I quoted the Quran and I said, Allah says that the Byzantine Empire, Rome, is, has been defeated by the Persian. One of the fellows got angry. He said, no, 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 that never happened. <laughs> then the other Orth Greek Orthodox Christians who were present, they had to calmly, calmly, calmly get the fellow to know, no, no, the Quran is correct. <laughs> Quran is correct. This happened before my eyes. And then the Quran says, Guli Bati Rome. Fiadnal of Rome was defeated in a land close by. But Rome will be victorious in just a few years. When this was revealed, the the Makkan Quraysh, the Kufar, the Shimushiku were laughing and were taunting us. And they challenged Abu Bakr Siddiq to a bet with the Allah Ta'ala. And Abu Bakr said, I'm ready for you. He had the money, eh? So they made a bet for six years. Because Bidde is in just a few years. When the Prophet heard it, he said, No, Abu Bakr. Bidde means between three and nine. Change the bet. Change the bet. So Abu Bakr changed the bet between three and nine. And between three and nine, it happened. And Abu Bakr won the death bet. And Rome was victorious. Now listen, now listen, now listen. Lillahi al It is Allah who has the authority to ordain victory. So Allah ordained victory to these people despite the fact that they were worshipping Jesus as the Son of God. Despite the fact that they were worshipping in the Trinity. And despite the fact that they changed the, the, the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. And then Allah went on to say, Lillahi al-Amr, authority for victory is with Allah, min qabl wa min ba'd. Min qabl wa min ba'd. And believe you me, you better put on your thinking cap for this one. If you believe that all the knowledge in the Quran has already been given, then I ask you, why would Allah say that He sent the Quran to a people who think, huh? why have I come to Britain? All that I've come to Britain to do is to ask you to think. Yes, that's all. On Judgment Day, there are lots of things, lots of surprises to come for those who don't think. So I urge you to think, eh? 
min qabl wa min ba'd Allah is the one who ordains victory min qabl meaning before wa min ba'd meaning after before and after but before does not make sense on it unless it is before something otherwise what is the meaning of before and after has no sense on it it is after something otherwise what is the sense of after so between between before and after there have to be something allah is inviting you to think what is there in between our commentators of the quran came to the conclusion that there will be two victories the first one which occurred in the lifetime of the prophet al-islam and the second victory after that but unfortunately many of them came to the conclusion that the second victory was the battle of badr which is wrong shall be so because the context is two victories for rome two victories for rome that's the context and between the two victories of rome there is something which it is in the context of that something that you have one victory before it and one victory after it and you cannot understand what is between the two without the jal <laughs> that the jal is at work with rome to so corrupt rome that there is going to be a point of departure a point of division a point which separates one part from the other and there'll be one victory before this and one victory after this. what is it between the two i did my research you must do yours and i came to the conclusion that the defining moment that the quran is speaking about before and after is the great schism of 1054 when one part of rome remained in constantinople and the other part of rome came to the west and out of this part of rome which came to the west emerged modern western civilization and from this civilization we find such an abandonment of the law such a scandalous abandonment of the law that a man can now marry another man and get a marriage certificate if that is not enough to bring clarity of thought what else what else is there modern western civilization emerged from that schism dajjal is the author of that schism he is the one who corrupted them and as a result of that allah gave this curse upon them kunu qiradatan khasin and it is in modern western civilization you can see the preference for public nudity being naked in public and sexual relations in public and if you still cannot understand and imran hussein is wrong then you eating biryani and going home and sleep i think at the age of 76 i'm entitled to speak a little sternly like this to younger people who were not even born when i started teaching this subject and yet who have this arrogance in them arrogance in them they show disrespect to me they close the doors of the masjid to me but there will be a judgment day and if i am wrong you should correct me no when i offer an opinion i always say do not accept my opinion unless you are convinced that i am correct so i'm not involved in any brainwashing no i'm not involved in brainwashing i am inviting people to think and alhamdulillah they are thinking they are thinking i was amazed to see how many students thousands i have in britain even more amazing he said although i don't speak french my french is not too good i have more students in france than i have in britain <laughs> why because most of the muslims in britain are pakistanis indian bangladeshi who don't have the arabic language and the overwhelming majority of the muslims of france and belgium are arabs Arabs and with them it's direct communication when i speak when i recite the quran direct communication what happened in 1054 what is it that broke the camel's back in suratul maida allah speaks at the end of suratul maida take a note take a note take a note 
He speaks to Nabi Isa Islam and he says, Oh Jesus, did you say this? You know what it is? Come on, shake your head. Did you say to the people? He's shaking his head. Nobody else is shaking their head. Well, you don't study the Quran. Huh? You have work to do in Putin. Imam, did you say to the people to take me and my mother as gods beside Allah? Did you say that? He's not asking about who, why did you say, did you say you were the son of God? He didn't ask about that. He didn't ask, what about the Trinity? No, he didn't ask about that. No. He only asked, did you tell the people to take me and my mother as God beside Allah, meaning God the Father? Meaning God the Father. What happened in, in 1054 is that the Christianity of the West, they changed an agreement which had come in the Council of Nicaea through Constantine. In the Council of Nicaea, most of the Christians came, most of them. And they came to a conclusion to stop that fellow in North Africa, Arias, who was saying, Jesus is not God. Don't worship Jesus. Huh? And they smothered him and they finished with him. <laughs> so the, all of Christianity now believe in Jesus as God. So they finished with Arias. But they said that God the Father is the real God. And God the Son does not have the same status as the Father. Up to this day, the Gospel says, the Injil says, only the Father knows the last day. The Son does not know. Every Christian has to believe this. So, the, in the Council of Nicaea, they said that the Holy Spirit, in Britain they call it the Holy Ghost. The British always like to do things differently. <laughs> but the rest of the world say the Holy Spirit. Spirit, the Ruh al Kudus. They say that the Ruh al Kudus is part of the God, Godhead. Yeah? But in Council of Nicaea, they said the Holy Spirit comes from the God the Father. And you remember the three questions? Do you remember the three questions the Jews said, Ask your prophet? Only a prophet can answer. You remember? You know, shake your head. Eh? What was one of the questions? Ask him about the Ruh. And what was the answer? That the Holy Spirit comes from Allah. And Nicaea said, the Holy Spirit comes from God the Father. So the Son and the Holy Spirit are not God like Allah. That was the original of Christian belief. God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, they are not equal to God the Father. He is the real God. But the Western Church changed it in 1054. And they said that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. And that broke the camel's back. That broke the camel's back. And this is what Allah is referring to. And then the question, the Western world started worshipping Mary. So when Allah said, did you say to the people, worship me and my mother as God beside Allah. Allah is referring to something specific. He's referring to the corruption of what was there in Constantinople by the Dal. In consequence of which a Western Christian church came, which now worships Mary and considers Jesus to be equal to the Son equal to the Father. So now we can see the second victory that is to come to Rome has not as yet come. It will come to that part of the Christian world, which still considers the Father to be above the Son. And now the Quran continues that on both occasions the room is victorious. What does the Quran say? Wa yawma izin, wa yawma izin, yafrahul mu'minun. And on that day, when room is victorious, first time and second time, you Muslims will celebrate establishing a positive relationship between the world of Islam and that part of room we still consider God the Father to be superior to God the Son. Now then, Constantinople has a pivotal role to play in the end of history. We've known now what, what Dajjal did to, to corrupt the Christians and to cause this part to come here 
and now they go fishing and Allah has cursed them to be apes huh? and they are the ones who take the son and make him equal to the father and from this part has emerged modern western civilization this is an Islamic eschatological explanation of the origin of modern western civilization I don't think anyone has ever done it before this is the first time it's been done and yet they close the doors they close the doors of the masjid to me yes shame on them now then Nabi Muhammad said you will most certainly conquer Constantinople and he praised the army and he praised the commander a Christian would ask why would a Muslim army want to conquer a Christian city when the Lord God himself he ordained that we should conquer this city we better have an answer hmm? remember these people said la ilaha illallah allahu akbar and one side fell they repeated second side fell. and so it is allah who ordained that they get the city so why would a muslim army want to conquer a christian city that allah has ordained to be a christian city we better have an answer our answer is that at the time when the Muslim army is to conquer the city it will be after the Great War or the Malhama they call it Armageddon Nabi Muhammad is speaking with his companion Maaz ibn Jabal and the hadith is in the Sunnah of Abi Dawood and he says Umaran Ubayt al-Maqdis Kharabu Yatrib he gives a timeline of events that the first event to look for is when Jerusalem is center stage in the world that's where Jerusalem is now and at that time look at, at Yatrib which is Medina it plays absolutely no role it's fall on desolation that way Yatrib is now yeah? that's where Yatrib is now fall on desolation a country with when you go inside the consulate they kill you and they chop up your body into bits and then they take a, a bone saw and they saw the bones into bits and they probably evaporate the whole body in 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 um, in, in um, acid and then they tell a mountain of lies that even the cia oh. <laughs> even the cia has to tell them you're lying Look, look, <laughs> this, this is the status. When this is in place, Prophet said, the next event that will occur would be the Malhama, the Great War. And that Great War is a war which will be fought over the mountain of gold. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I don't have the time to explain. One side of that war will suffer 99% kill, not the other side. And if you go to Surah to Rahman, you know, Allah is not, he's not, he doesn't waste words in the Quran. No, no, no. He's very economical in the use of language in the Quran. Sometimes he'll use only one word. One word. So when in one surah of the Quran, he repeats one ayah or one verse 31 times. Could that be by accident? When, when, when will you start to think? If you think that the Quran is there spread out with knowledge, you just have to eat. You run. Allah has sent the Quran and He's commanded you to think. Yes, if you fail to think, you'll pay the price. That's all I'm doing in Britain, asking you to think. In Surah Al Rahman, he has said it 31 times to so knock on your head 31 times that he's going to intervene in this great war that's coming so nafrugu lakum ayyuhal thakalan but I don't have the time this will take me another 10 minutes to, to go with Surah to Rahman to show you that Allah will intervene in that great war what I can say is the great war is soon it's coming because they're lusting for war with Russia 
But when the Great War takes place, Rome will be victorious a second time. Yes, because that's in the Quran. Rome will be victorious on the second time. So Rome on that side, still holding on to the religious way of life, and this side, Kunu Kiradatan Khasim, be apes despise. In this side and that side, whose side, which side will Allah be with? Huh? <laughs> After the Great War takes place, one hadith says, only seven months, only seven months, and you'll have the conquest of Constantinople and then the Khuruj of Dajjal. The other hadith says, seven years. Abu Dawood argues that this second hadith is better than the first one. But whether it is seven months or seven years, is a short period of time, very short period of time. So that as soon as the attack takes place on Russia, that's it, the Great War takes place, and within a short span of time, either seven months or seven years, not only will you have the conquest of Constantinople, but the child will be released into the world in a human form. And you see him as a human being, but you will not be able to recognize that he's a jasad, which is one part of the lecture I still have to deal with. And so we say to the Christian, oh, but the conquest of Constantinople has not taken place as yet. Why? Because the Great War has not yet taken place. And the conquest of Constantinople takes place after the Great War. And Constantinople was conquered by the Ottoman army in 1453. And since then, Constantinople has become a Muslim city. So, a Muslim army will not be conquering a Christian city. It will be conquering a Muslim city. Next question, please. They say, no, no, no. No, no. Why would, why would a Muslim army don't want to conquer a Muslim city? Answer that. <laughs> You thought we were finished? No, we have to give an explanation. Why would a Muslim army, Nabi Muhammad Islam has prophesied, a Muslim army would conquer a Muslim city? Why? We better have an answer. The answer is that he praised this army and he praised this commander because you have been praising that army up to the sky and you have been praising that commander higher than the sky. That is why he's praising this army and praising this commander. This conquest of Constantinople will correct what was done wrong 600 years ago. Well, what was done wrong 600 years ago? You don't need to be a scholar. Even a schoolboy knows that Allah in the Quran has declared that if the enemy is inclined towards peace, you cannot fight him. You must also incline to peace. Even a schoolboy knows that. The Byzantine emperor in Constantinople had only seven to nine thousand people with him in the city. And the city was, was surrounded by two hundred thousand Ottoman troops. And the Byzantine Emperor was pleading for peace. We will pay you as we've been paying you in the past. The Ottoman Sultan took the Quran and threw it away and proceeded to wage war against an enemy that wanted peace. That violation of the law of, the, of Allah in the Quran has to be corrected. And he did more than that. In Surah Al Hajj of the Quran, Go check it out. Allah has commanded the believers. We have a mission in the, in the world. We have to protect the houses of Allah. He mentions masajid. He mentions temples. He mentions churches. He mentions synagogues, monasteries. He says, you have to protect these buildings. This is our mission. Go and check it out, Surah Al-Hajj. The fiqh or the law is subservient to the Quran. You can't make laws out there and pick which are in conflict with the Quran. The laws of war, bogus. When the Sultan Muhammad Fateh conquered Constantinople, the first thing that he did was to take Hagia Sophia, which was the greatest Christian cathedral in the world, which had been the greatest cathedral for 1,000 years. 
and he shamefully and disgracefully and sinfully transformed it into a masjid to the eternal shame and disgrace of the Ummah of Muhammad So when this army conquers Constantinople, it will be to correct what that one did. And when this army conquers Constantinople, Hagia Sophia will be returned to the Christians and there's nothing they can do to stop it. They can scream, they can shout, they can go crazy if they want. But the truth will prevail. And so, Constantinople in the Quran is important. When Constantinople is conquered and we correct the wrong that was done, when I met with those Greek Orthodox Christians, they were polite with me, yes. They were respectful with me, yes. But when I was speaking to them about the Quran, not one of them smiled. I would make jokes, nobody smiled, no. Here I make a joke, you smile. It is difficult, the speaker is speaking and he makes a joke and everybody's face is straight. Why? Because of the pain which is still in their hearts from what was done so long ago. Now when we return the cathedral to them, then you see the fulfillment of what Allah has said in the Quran and I don't have time to deal with the jasad al now. Allah says in the Quran, Wala tajidanna, and you will most certainly find at the time when the Quran was revealed and in time to come because it is fel modaria that those who will be closest in love and affection for you la tajidanna aqrabahum mawaddatan lilladhina amanu alladhina qalu inna nasara that a Christian people will be closest in love and affection for you I believe that before Nabi Isa alayhi salam comes that there will be many of them who will accept that Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu is the Prophet. And that there will be many of them who will accept that the Quran is the word of Allah. And I have been working with them. But that does not mean that they have to leave their ummah and join our ummah. They are already in Islam. When you join, when you accept that the Quran is the word of Allah, it will help you to correct the mistakes that you are making. The first thing that I want to deal with, gently with them, is to try to encourage them to return to the Sabbath. Eh? Return to Saturday, that is your Sabbath. And stop this nonsense about Sunday. I want to end now, I have not dealt with the Jasad, but look, it's already 9 o'clock. رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ سُمْيُ الْعَرِيمِ وَتُوْ عَلَيْنَا يَمُّنَانَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ تَوَّابُ رَحِيمِ بَرَحْمَةُكَ يَعْرْحَمَ الْرَحِيمِ